Today's video is kindly sponsored by Surfshark. Surfshark are a VPN or virtual private network that allows you to keep your personal data safe online. Surfshark allows you to connect to various VPN networks across the world, from the likes of Australia to the United States, which is a very important feature for me personally. When researching some true crime cases for this channel, we can't access some news articles because we do not live in that country, but Surfshark can allow you to access these articles articles quickly, easily and safely. I simply wouldn't be able to create the content I do without Surfshark. It's super fast and easy to use and you can use it on an unlimited amount of devices with just one subscription. Surfshark prides itself on prioritising the safety of your data and have a no logs policy so your data is never at risk. Exclusively for viewers of Dark Curiosities, Surfshark are offering 83% off and an extra three months free on a Surfshark subscription. All you have to do is click the link in the description below and enter the promo code CURIOSITY. Thank you to Surfshark once again for sponsoring today's video. <laughs> Mary Ellen Diener was born on July 27, 1951, in Memphis, Shelby County, Tennessee, and was the firstborn child to parents A.J. Neal and Cassie Diener Jones. Mary Ellen lived with her siblings in Mansfield, Ohio, a place deemed very safe by its residents. Mary Ellen was described by those who loved her as a responsible, active, bright and funny girl who loved riding her bike, playing with dolls and spending time with her friends. She and her siblings were very responsible and did what they could around the home, taking care of various everyday chores. On November 14, 1965, 14-year-old Mary Ellen and her 12-year-old sister, Brenda Sue, washed the family's clothes. However, their dryer had broken, so the girls decided to take the clothes to a nearby laundromat in Springmill Street, riding there in a taxi. Their grandmother lived right next door to the laundromat, so the fact that the girls were visiting under a veil of darkness and knowing that their grandmother was close by eased their mother's mind. Mary Ellen and Brenda arrived at the laundromat and threw the clothes into a dryer, but they ran out of change. Mary Ellen, being the elder sibling, took it upon herself to visit another nearby laundromat on North Mulberry Street to collect some change, a less than five minute walk. However, she never came back. Brenda started to become concerned when Mary Ellen failed to return. As a result, she went to her grandmother's house and told her that Mary Ellen hadn't come back from the laundromat. Their grandmother subsequently went out looking for Mary Ellen, telling Brenda to stay put at her home in the meantime. As their grandmother walked down towards the laundromat on North Mulberry Street, she saw flashing police lights and the body of a young girl lying on the roadside. It was Mary Ellen. She had been shot multiple times with a .32 calibre weapon. Police then visited all the nearby hardware stores that sold guns of a similar calibre, eventually stopping by the Diamond Hardware Store. There, they found within the company books a weapon matching the description of the gun used in Mary Ellen's murder, a .32 Ivor Johnson 11105. It had been purchased on October 23rd, 1965, just three weeks prior, by a man named Lester Edward Eubanks. 
It was reported by some witnesses that they saw Lester Eubanks in the Mansfield area on the night Mary Ellen was killed, shortly before the crime occurred. Mary Ellen's family did not personally know Lester, though according to one of Mary Ellen's sisters, Myrtle, she had seen him around town on numerous occasions. She thought that Lester was quite a strange individual, as he walked around with nunchucks in his hands and appeared to be a bit of a loner. He was also described by others as being a rather cocky, narcissistic and extremely opinionated young man. Eubanks was born on October 31st, 1943 in Sandusky, Ohio and grew up in the Mansfield area and had been arrested twice in the past for sex offences against young girls. At the time of Mary Ellen's death, Eubanks was out on a $5,000 bond after attempted rape of a minor. Police managed to trace 22-year-old Lester down and brought him in to the station for questioning, where he quickly and openly admitted to killing Mary Ellen, giving a very detailed account of the night in question. Eubanks told investigators that he was walking around the Mansfield area before he saw Mary Ellen in the laundromat. He then saw her running towards the second laundromat, and this was when he struck. He stopped by a nearby house, with Mary Ellen stopping within arm's length. She asked Eubanks what he was doing, to which he replied he didn't like it when people walked behind him, therefore he wanted her to pass by. Mary Ellen was, according to Eubanks, holding a bottle of soda, which she raised above her mouth, perhaps in preparation to strike him. But at this point, Lester pulled Mary Ellen behind the house and she started to scream. He then placed his hand over her mouth before shooting her twice. Eubanks made a quick getaway back to his apartment just a block away, leaving the 14-year-old girl to bleed out. Lester arrived home, changed into different clothes and went out clubbing, as if nothing had ever happened. However, on his way to the club, he passed the crime scene for a second time, only to realise that Mary Ellen was still conscious, though in unfathomable pain. Eubanks picked up a brick from a nearby alley before striking Mary Ellen over the head, killing her. The Diener family were subsequently left shaken to the core and heartbroken after discovering what happened to Mary Ellen. Their family had been completely torn apart. In May of 1966, Lester Eubanks was put on trial for the murder of Mary Ellen Diener. He testified and did not appear to show any remorse for his crimes. He was only sorry that he got caught. Eubanks pleaded guilty and was ultimately sentenced to death by electric chair. Justice had been served for young Mary Ellen, or so it was thought. Eubanks was put on death row at Ohio State Penitentiary in downtown Columbus. His execution date was pushed back on several occasions and in 1972, following the abolishment of the death penalty in Ohio State, his sentence was automatically lessened to life imprisonment and he was put back into general population. Lester was, according to fellow prisoners, quite the smooth talker and managed to win over the trust of prison guards. Due to his good behaviour, Eubanks was placed into an honour programme, which was developed to help convicts prepare for life outside of prison walls. 
This meant that Lester could participate in certain activities outside of the penitentiary, such as running various errands. Many questioned why Eubanks, who was a repeat sex offender, not to mention a child murderer, was allowed such opportunities. Chances were, upon being let out of the prison system, he would more than likely re-offend. On December 7th, 1973, eight years after Mary Ellen Diener had been murdered, Lester and a handful of other prisoners were allowed to go to the Great Southern Shopping Centre to buy Christmas gifts. Each inmate was dressed in normal, everyday attire, rather than going in their usual prison uniforms, and each were equipped with some cash. The guards who drove them to the shopping centre told them to purchase Christmas gifts for their families, alone and without being in the presence of any prison staff. They told them to report back to them at approximately 2pm that afternoon, just a few hours later. Only Lester Eubanks failed to show. He was now a fugitive on the run. Mary Ellen's family were left angry and upset after discovering that Lester had escaped from prison, after only having served eight years of his life sentence. They, amongst others, heavily scrutinised the prison's honour programme. Why would they allow a murderer and a repeat sex offender to roam free in a public place? It was the perfect opportunity for him to disappear, and he took it. Investigators did not believe Lester's escape was a spur-of-the-moment decision, but that he had been planning his escape for quite some time. Having looked at his visitations whilst incarcerated, it was discovered that he had been visited once monthly for years, but in the few months leading up to his escape, these visitations became far more regular, once every week. Did he somehow get assistance outside of the prison? Did someone help him to escape, perhaps a family member or one of his associates? Lester's family and friends were subsequently questioned extensively by authorities. However, they all claimed to know nothing of his escape. Franklin County Sheriff's Office immediately put out a local warrant for Lester's arrest, and the FBI also issued a federal arrest warrant. However, despite their best efforts, Eubanks had gone up in smoke. After years of silence on this case, in December of 1993, the Detective Bureau Commander, Captain John R. Curry, wanted to see if any updates had occurred in Lester's case. And rather shockingly, when checking for Lester in the system's database, there were no active warrants out for his arrest, either local or federal. Both had been mysteriously removed from the system, and in technical terms, Eubanks was a free man. This meant that if Lester had even committed a petty crime, such as being pulled over in his car for speeding, he would not have flashed up on the system as a fugitive. It was after this shocking discovery that authorities appealed to the public through America's Most Wanted, in the hopes to bring exposure to the case. The team received a phone call from a woman who claimed to know Lester from Los Angeles in the 1970s. She told authorities that at that time, Eubanks had been living with his cousin's widow, so police went to the residence to investigate in October of 1994. Though she appeared anxious, the woman, Kay Banks, fully cooperated with authorities. She openly voiced her own concerns about possibly harbouring a fugitive and wanted to be completely honest with police. 
She told them that Lester had randomly showed up at her home one day, and following this, he stayed with Kay for a while, though he started to become aggressive towards her, so she devised a plan to get rid of him. Kay told Lester that the authorities had called her asking about him, and it was at this point Lester immediately packed his bags and left. Kay never saw him again. She also told police that whilst he was incarcerated, she and Lester wrote to each other regularly, and that following his escape, he went incognito in Michigan, where he earned a living by painting houses. After a few weeks, Lester, who adopted the alias of Victor Young, took a bus to California in late December of 1973, Lester told Kay that when he got to California, the bus was pulled over by the authorities. He told Kay that he thought his time on the run was up, but the police were not looking for him. As a matter of fact, illegal fruit was being brought across state lines. The bus was inspected and police left. Once again, Eubanks had evaded capture by a mere whisker. According to Kay, she provided details about Eubanks' employment at a mattress manufacturer's in Gardena, where the manager confirmed Lester worked until 1985 or 86, but where he worked thereafter remains somewhat of a mystery. Interestingly, the only identification so-called Victor Young used was a hunting licence, as no fingerprints or photo ID were needed on them. Police believed that Lester's family knew where he was hiding. In 2003, investigators looked into his father, Mose Eubanks, as he was the only close relative who lived near Leicester at the time. However, upon questioning him, Mose seemed very evasive when asked about his son. He refused point-blank to talk about him, and even began talking to police about when people change and start new lives. This left police convinced that Moles knew exactly where Lester was, but they couldn't prove it. According to an informant, Mose had received a phone call when she visited him on one occasion, and he told her that he was on the phone with his son in Alabama, who was on a break whilst painting a house. These phone calls were quite regular, and police managed to trace the calls back to a centre for troubled youth. A man matching Lester's description worked there as a janitor, and rather interestingly, he didn't have a driver's licence and his social security number appeared to be fake, leading authorities to believe that the man was possibly Lester Eubanks. Unfortunately, just months prior to discovering this lead, the man in question had left the establishment. Once again, Lester Eubanks had evaded capture. In the second series of Netflix's recommissioned Unsolved Mysteries, Lester Eubanks' case was featured in the episode Death Row Fugitive. Authorities are hopeful that the more exposure this case gets, the more likely they are in capturing Lester Eubanks and bringing him to justice for the murder of Mary Ellen Diener. At the time of his escape, Lester Edward Eubanks was 30 years old, of African-American origins with black hair and dark brown eyes. He stood at 5 feet 11 inches tall and weighed approximately 175 pounds. He had a half-inch scar on the left side of his face, a mole under his left eye and on the left side of his mouth, and a one-inch scar on his left wrist. 
He also has a very identifiable thick one inch scar which wraps around his upper right arm. If alive today, in 2021, he would be turning 78 years old. Lester was known to use the aliases of Victor Young, Pete Eubanks and Lester William Eubanks. He's known to have family and associates in Ohio, Michigan, Florida, Alabama, Texas, California and Washington. And it is believed he relies on his network of associates to evade capture. It is also important to note that Eubanks was a very talented artist, which according to investigators may help in identifying him. The US Marshals Service is currently offering up to a $50,000 reward for any information leading to the arrest of Lester Eubanks. All Mary Ellen's family want is justice and for Lester to be punished accordingly for his crimes. He's avoided the death penalty, life imprisonment and capture for over 48 years. Authorities believe it's only a matter of time before Eubanks is apprehended and punished for taking the life of a bright young girl who had her entire life ahead of her. If you know anything regarding the whereabouts of Lester Eubanks or have any information regarding the murder of Mary Ellen Diener, you can contact the US Marshals Service Communication Centre at 1-800-336-0102. 